the device is mm. the size of a penny and it weighs as much of like a raisin. You can imagine that that's really easy to fit into small nooks and crannies. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Since its inception in 1952, the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program has helped ensure the quality, vitality, and diversity of the scientific and engineering workforce by recognizing and supporting outstanding graduate students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines who are pursuing research-based master's and doctoral degrees at accredited United States institutions. Past fellows have become lifelong leaders, contributing significantly to both scientific innovation and teaching. They include over 40 Nobel Prize laureates, former U.S. Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu, and Google co-founder Sergey Brin. We are joined today by Kyle Johnson, a Ph.D. student in computer science and engineering at the University of Washington who became a GRFP fellow in 2021. Mr. Johnson, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I want to start with a little bit of background and kind of get to how you got interested in robots. Were you into computers as a kid? Were you into video games? Like, what was your path to getting to where you're researching with robots? I think uh, math would definitely be the starting place. I always was taking my older brother's math homework assignments when I was younger. So I was kind of like learning about, you know, multiplication, even though I was still like in kindergarten. Um, and he really enjoyed like teaching me. And so getting kind of like a hold of those scientific and mathematical concepts at a younger age kind of naturally drew me into learning about things like I used to have an old MP3 player that when it broke, instead of, you know, saying, oh, I want to buy a new one, I was like, well, let me see if I can fix this. Let me see if I can, you know, short circuit or, or fix, you know, some kind of component in there that's going to be able to make that device work. And so from a young age, I was kind of a tinkerer. And that kind of continued and pushed me towards the robotics field, uh, especially when it was like, you know, now that I'm in a PhD program and I can tinker with things that I'm actually getting to build from the ground up. I, I find that very uh, cathartic and nostalgic to my, my you know, childhood you know, youth and imagination. As an aside, uh, were you successful with the MP3 player? Yes, it turns out that there was a short circuit. All I needed was a little piece of metal, which I broke off from a pin, and I could put it in and I could fix the short circuit on the MP3 player to get it to work again. Nice. Uh, so moving into your research, I want to start with the Millie Mobile Robot. And can you tell us what it is to start with? Within the scientific community, this idea of like swarms of really tiny mobile robots has kind of just been science fiction. And so what the goal of that project was to take science fiction and turn it into, you know, real science and engineering. And so Millimobile is like a first of its kind battery free mobile device that's able to, to move, you know, at a, a pretty decent speed across a wide area. Um, using ambient energy. When it's harvesting those ambient lights and radio waves, it's actually able to use its four wheels, kind of like a car, in order to determine the direction that it wants to go in, which is based off of whatever sensory input that it's getting. And so there's five different sensors that we put on that device in order to track light. And so it's determining a gradient in order to follow which direction the light is coming from, kind of like a bug would do that wants to seek out its energy source. When we have you know, solar panels on the Millimobile, it's seeking out light because that's its energy source. That's what gives it its power. And then there are other sensors you can put on board as well, you know, for like gas or temperature, humidity, other type of metrics you might want to measure. And then that can be sent over Bluetooth off the device to like a base station or to other robots for communication. So you mentioned the Bluetooth, like, like, is there an interface? Like, is there a way you're communicating with it to set it to do these? Or is it really autonomous and it's like searching out for light? So we uh, established a platform because the platform can do whatever you program it to. And so what we were showcasing um, in the paper that we pushed was that there's this autonomous behavior. So you program it to seek out its light source or its energy source. And then it goes and it seeks it out autonomously and you never have to touch it. Again, the innovation there being that it operates indefinitely. There's no battery that dies. It doesn't, you know, get lost or reach its highest point and then say, okay, I've succeeded and I'm just going to turn off. It's just constantly seeking out light sources. And as that changes in the environment around it, the Millimobile adapts to just seek that out. So I want to talk about the power sources some more because you, you mentioned it being able to collect like like solar powered light. And you also mentioned RF waves. So is this a common thing for power sources to be radio waves? 
Yeah, it depends on the application. We haven't really seen mobile devices uh, take advantage of these these RF harvesting circuits because the amount of energy that you get from RF harvesting is really small. It's typically in the microwatts. And so movement, uh, as you can imagine, is kind of an expensive task. And so typically you can see some RF harvesting circuits for smaller computational tasks on, you know, maybe really like lightweight microcontrollers that don't need much power in order to operate. And what we actually showed was if you take this intermittent computing idea, which is a way for these microcontrollers or, you know, the, the brains of the computer to maybe do some processing in a couple of milliseconds and then fall asleep for like 900 plus milliseconds. So that maybe it's only actually doing operation for like mm-hmm. five to 10% of the time. And the rest of the time, it's just kind of in this really low power sleep mode. That idea and concept that enabled RF harvesting on these microcontrollers is what we kind of took and applied to mobility. So instead of now the device constantly moving, you know, you turn your car engine on and it's just always ready to move. What we have is this intermittent motion idea where most of the time the device is actually just sitting there gathering energy up and it stores it and then it uses it for a motion and then it waits again and gathers more of that energy and so what that allowed us to do was actually get movement out of just microwatts of power i believe down to like 50 microwatts that still resulted in the device being able to like move now as you were working on this project were there any challenges as you're designing yeah this idea of intermittent motion wasn't actually something that we had at first um, originally we had these small solar cells that we, you know, had lying around in the lab and we had some of these, um, eccentric rotating mass or ERM motors that are specifically used to like be really low power. They're the, you know, parts and phones that buzz and vibrate. And so there's a lot of innovation that's been used, right. In order to make those really small and really low power because we don't want our phones dying. And so with these two things, I was like, oh, can we actually get, just power directly from this energy harvesting component, like a solar cell, to just move the motor continuously. And when we saw that it had to have like 100% ideal light conditions on the sunniest of days in order to move that motor, the next thought was, okay, well, we're close. What kind of approach can we take in order to kind of get it all the way there? And that's where we thought of using um, capacitors, which are just a small little storage element to take in and store energy from that, you know, energy harvesting component and then release it in discrete steps into the motor. Because what we found was that you can get really, really small capacitors that when you um, release that energy from the capacitor into the motor, it actually gets like, oh, half a turn. Or if it's a slightly bigger capacitor, like a full turn out of the, the motor's wheel. And so that was kind of how we developed this idea of intermittent motion in order to get, you know, movement in really high light environments or really high energy environments where maybe it looks continuous because it's happening so quickly, so many times a second. But then it also works and is able to be mobile in these really, really low energy environments. At that point, it just moves slower, but it's not stopping, which a lot of devices now, if they don't have the energy to like, you know, turn on like your phone, it doesn't just operate slower. It just doesn't operate. You mentioned kind of different sensors you could put on it. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the applications you can imagine this being used for? Yeah, for sure. And don't let me limit anyone's imagination. Like I mentioned before, I we tried to design a platform so that it could be used for a ton of different things. The things that came to my mind originally was in agriculture. So we have like sensors on board that could measure temperature, as I mentioned, or humidity, or, you know, even like soil moisture and things like that, that might be helpful for farmers. You can think about a hydroponic farm already has, you know, specific grow lights in that kind of environment to help the plants grow. What that means is that you have a nice power source for the robot as well, because these grow lights are a little bit brighter than your average everyday indoor lights. And so we showcased there that like actually with those grow lights, the millimobile is able to move pretty quickly in order to get, you know, sensor measurements from different places. So instead of maybe having one fixed sensor that can, you know, cause bias within just getting a measurement that maybe is overwatered or underwater, you can actually have a device that can move around and get different measurements from different areas. And then now you need less sensors because you actually have one that's mobile. And so that's one application. There's lots of others, you know, you could think from search and rescue, the device is Mm -hmm. the size of a penny and it weighs as much of like a raisin. 
And so you can imagine that that's really easy to fit into small nooks and crannies in order to go and maybe look for, you know, temperature sources for detecting whether a person is, you know, under some rubble. Or you can imagine putting it in a pipe, you know, that's too small to have, you know, a larger robot or a person to get through. But this little device might be able to roll through there and it could detect, you know, gas leaks or other types of, you know, industrial accidents. Like maybe it has some high electromagnetic field that's kind of dangerous for people to go into. Right. That, again, ends up being a benefit for the device because if we have an RF energy harvester on there, as it's finding this higher energy, it actually is able to move more quickly. And so there's just lots of different applications you can imagine for almost any type of sensor that could be put on board. Now, one of your other projects is something called an origami flyer. So can you tell me about what that one is? Yeah, so that was the idea that when you scale things down to be really small, uh, kind of similar to an ant, they don't go very far very fast. <laughs> um, even if they're moving as fast as they can, they're just they're tiny devices, so it takes them a long time to go over long distances. And that's actually a problem that you see farmers have where we want to like, you know, get different measurements of crops over acres and acres and acres of land. And we want to have measurements to make sure that all of those crops are actually being, you know, properly you know, cultivated. And so we have, you know, sensors that people will manually go out and they'll place every, you know, meter over these acres and acres. And it's a very tedious task. And it takes a lot of time. And then you can't even really tell like, oh, if one of these sensors um, is broken, then now a person has to go all the way back out there, right, in order to like fix it. And so the idea was, can we automate that process? Can we remove that manual placements of these sensors over acres and acres of land in order to get those readings that are really useful for crops? And can we have a device that can deploy itself to get those same readings? And so the idea with this origami micro flyer was that if you have one drone that has a box of just you know, hundreds or thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of these origami micro flyers, it can drop them from one central location and they can self disperse over a large area. The origami part is this leaf out origami structure that we found in one state actually tumbles kind of like an elm leaf and travels really far laterally. So you can imagine, you know, if you were to drop um, a piece of paper, you know, it kind of has this like tumbling pattern to it where if a gust of wind comes, the paper goes out really far. Um, it's similar to like an umbrella. And in the other state, what we found is this origami structure was able to actually act more like a maple leaf where it falls straight down. So similar to the way where you could say an umbrella has its like closed state, or maybe if you drop it, it kind of acts like a torpedo straight to the ground. And um, if you know, you open the umbrella up, sometimes the wind can just take it and it goes really far. The structure has these two states that act differently the same way an umbrella would. And we can control when it's in each of those states in order to get them to either disperse really far out or fall straight down if we want it to kind of like land in that location. Is there, what's the control mechanism? Like you said, it'll, it can kind of choose itself, but if you're, I would think that you need to choose one to begin with or something or in the process, maybe you would change it, but is there a control mechanism for that? Yeah. So there's this little electromagnetic actuator on board that gets controlled by a microcontroller that's also Bluetooth capable. And so with that Bluetooth capable device, there's three different ways we can decide whether we want to transition or not in order to make sure that we have the furthest dispersal. One is the microcontroller has a timer on board. So if you're dispersing, you know, a thousand of these, maybe every half a second, one of them is, you know, transitioning while the others continue to tumble further away. And so you can do it based off of a timer. It's Bluetooth capable for sending and receiving packets. So you can also send signals to each of these devices, maybe individually, in order to get them to transition at different times from a base station. And then the third uh, method for, you know, transitioning between the two structures uh, that we explored was actually using an onboard um, pressure sensor that we could use to actually estimate altitude. So you could actually pre-program them to transition at different altitudes so that if you're dropping it from a 50 meter drop height and maybe you have 50 of them, each of them will actually transition at a specific altitude like 50 and another one transitions at 49 and another one transitions at 48, 47, 46 and so on. So that what you get is that 
um, the sensors will actually be in that state where they're traveling very far, you know, for different amounts of time, causing that like even dispersal over a large area. From here, I want to segue into your graduate research fellowship. Can you tell me about getting that award? What was the application experience like for you? Yeah, no, the the GRFP or the Graduate Research Fellowship Program was was huge for me because I actually applied for the GRFP uh, proposing that origami robotics approach in order to make robots that don't need batteries because we can take advantage of these these low energy, you know, and uh, different properties within the origami in order to make these devices more robust in ways that hadn't been made before. And what was cool was that when I got the GRFP to support that work, I was much more convincing when I was talking to uh, professors and faculty about wanting to explore in that space. Uh, I got a lot of pushback, you know, from a good number of uh, professors that are like, that's, that's a crazy idea. That's ridiculous. You know, that's never going to happen. And I'm like, well, kind of have this fellowship program, you know, that's telling me that it was a good idea and that I do have funding in order to explore that. And so I think that was a big part of the push that was able to actually make these devices a reality. How has that impacted your work? Like you, you said you you had pitched the origami flyer as part of the, the plan. What else, like, did the other one fall under this program also? Like, what, what other things have you worked on? Yeah, it's a- allowed me to re- research a lot of crazy ideas. Um which have so far worked out pretty well. Um, the Origami Microflyer was the first project that I started on. And what actually came from that was the Millimobile project. We had these solar cells in the lab that I mentioned because we were you know, using them for the Origami Microflyer project. We had motors that we were sitting around because we were trying to figure out in the, the early stages, how do we actuate the, the origami? You know, So we looked into a ton of different types of, you know, motors and and servos and other types of devices that, you know, traditional robotics cysts will use in order to like move a device. And so once we had these parts laying around, it's like, okay, well, how else can we apply, you know, these tools and, and this process to make other devices that maybe have other forms of locomotion? We're actually working on like a small aerial vehicle mm-hmm. that will actually be able to fly kind of similar to a helicopter. Um, and we're trying to scale that down to about the size of a quarter. We're working on small, like flea sized jumping robots. And this is all kind of using that technology that we, you know, have discovered and found in making that first microflyer project. And it kind of has opened up this space of a lot of different types of locomotion and mobility that can be enabled at the like insect scale. Special thanks to Kyle Johnson. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.